Hello, everyone. We have another topic provided by a listener, but let's, we're going to start with our beginning, talking about how our weeks were going, and how was Mother's Day? Mother's Day was awesome. <laughs> it always is. I mean, you know, you're a mom. It's awesome. Um, I got to take a nap, which, you know. Well, oh, your nice. your daughter's old enough to where she can. She is, I know. She can actually fend for herself. So yeah, this was like the first year. She's eight years old. This was like the first year I took a nap on Mother's Day. Okay. Yeah. Um, but my uh, my husband and my daughter got me um, a twenty three and Me test. So I'm really excited about doing that. Which, if you don't know what that is, is like a DNA test to tell you what you should eat, shouldn't eat. Yes. It's basically like your ancestral things which is pretty cool yes um, so i think we're going to talk about that maybe in a future podcast yeah i think that'd be really interesting to find out um what i did well actually what levi did for her mother he, he made her pancakes and all that good stuff in bed which basically means i made it all but it was fun <laughs> it was fun he had he and she didn't get sleep in she never she never does once he's up she's up so that's just the way it goes well right all right, so this next topic, we're talking about stress, stress eating. It was actually Stress Awareness Week last week or two oh, weeks was ago. was it really? Yeah, at work it was. Jeez. And as I am her emotional animal at work, and I help bounce ideas, struggles, I think stress. everyone needs an emotional animal. Yeah. It's like unbelievably helpful to be able to talk about things with someone that you trust. Uh, I mean, like, sometimes if you just say something out loud, it'll either help you realize that whatever you're worrying over is really insignificant, or at least the other person can sort of, like, lend their thoughts and insights. Yeah, it d- definitely it. does help because it gives you perspective. You're like, did you think about this? You're like, oh, no, I didn't think about that. So so, so. is she, like, a, is she, I'm guessing she's, like, a stress eater? No, she was just really, she does sometimes, I think, um, not to stereotype, but I think more women stress eat than men sometimes. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I think men just, we swallow, like, if you ever watch King of the Hill, Hank just swallows his emotions, so he just gulps it down. So that's how, <laughs> that's how men deal with it, I guess. Um, so her question was really about stress eating and coping with stress. So I think everyone has that one time or another has dealt with some stress in their life. I mean, obviously we... Um, don't just live with uh, unicorns and fluffy clouds and eat ice cream every day. Um, And some tend to hold in your shoulders, you know, some Ted's back, head, other areas, you know, knots tighten up and build up over time and then you just either explode or you have to go to a chiropractor because your neck's sideways because you have so much stress. I have all that fun stuff. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. (laughs) So whenever she snaps and snaps my neck during a podcast, we'll know why. (laughs) Right. So I think it's fair that we all deal with it in many different ways. Um, But Kelly, you know, when you're stressed, what is the one negative way you use to cope? And give me an example at that time. So after I had my daughter, um, I started drinking wine again. I've always liked wine. I like the taste of it. But at that time, um, because I was under a lot of stress and um, I am not a baby person, I'm like the one odd woman on the planet who is not a baby and person. And you didn't become a baby person? No. Okay. No. Like when my daughter turned about four is when I started to enjoy being a mother a little bit more. Um, Because they can talk back to you. Well, she became a little bit more independent. And, you know, it was just, I've just, I'm not a baby person. And so it was. I would agree with that. I'm kind of the same way. I think the first year was hard. Yes. Because it's like, what do you do? One time he was just crying. I had no idea why. I had to pull him up like a football just so he could poop. And I'm like, oh, that's all you needed? (laughs) You could have just told me (laughs) to say, dad, hold my whatever what knees to my chest so i could poop if you would have told me that i've been fine <laughs> right. but yeah johanna could tell you stories but it's go. just constant you know when they're babies it's just constant and i just found it very difficult to enjoy that part of mm-hmm. the process but anyway 
so I started, you know, after she was born, um, and you know, you're allowed to, and, and, and I stopped breastfeeding. Okay. <laughs> just so everybody's not all up in my, in my stuff. Right. Um, I started drinking wine and a glass per night turned into almost a bottle a night. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So I was spending a lot of money too. Yeah. Um, and you know, I guess again, being a new mom, it, it's just hard. I was deprived of sleep at the time. Like most new moms are. Um, I'm tr- I was trying to take care of all of our animals, and at the time, we st- we still had three, um, you know, normal, like, big-sized horses, and, you know, trying to take care of all the household household chores, plus feeding a fussy baby. Um, she struggled with latching properly, um, and even with the bottle, she just, she just didn't want to take the bottle very well. Sure. Um, and it's, it seemed to me like she would never sleep like the other babies. She was extremely active. She started walking at nine months old. Yeah. Um, That's how Levi is. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so she was just always like up and needing. She was just, she didn't want me to really hold her. She didn't like to be cuddled and held, but at the same time she wanted to see everything. Yeah, she wants, she's just curious. She just wants to yes. learn as much as she can. Yeah. And at the same time, I often felt like I wasn't quote unquote doing enough um, because I wasn't contributing financially. Like my job as a mom was somehow less important or it was quote unquote easy, which, you know, it's not. And it was also a really tough for, tough time for me in my marriage because as you probably know, as most couples having their first child know, kids change the dynamic of your relationship. And so, I mean, we all love our kids, but staying at home with kids all day is probably the hardest job in the world. And, and luckily I I have a husband who even, you know, he'll say, you know, when he was home on weekends to help me out, even he would say this staying at home with the baby is harder than anything that I would do at work. Um, and I think just not being able to talk to an adult. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge too. Johanna's like. I just want to talk to an adult <laughs> that just doesn't go, bye, 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 bye. My clients with younger kids, it's so funny when they come for workouts, it's like just this, you know, barrage of like, I just listen and they just talk and yeah. talk and talk and I make them work out, but they talk and talk and it, yeah, there's not, there's no real adult conversation. Um, so anyway, as soon as my husband would walk in the door though, I mean, I pretty much handed the kid over and corked the bottle. Oh, wow. And so it just became a really bad habit. So anyway, how about you? Like, how have you coped in the past and, like, give an example? Oh, best example. I use food a lot to cope with stress, depression, all that fun stuff. And we've covered that before, but we'll go into a little bit deeper maybe. Um, So my biggest memory would be when I was out of a job. I lost my job through whatever issues, and we're not going to go into that, but I was looking frivolously. I was looking for another job. I was trying to find something. Um, I don't remember if this is the first time or second time, but um, I remember at one time I applied at a bowling alley and they said I was overqualified to work at a bowling alley. Oh, I, I'm just like, I need a job. I will clean out nasty shoes. I just need something to do. <laughs> right, give me some money. <laughs> exactly. And I wasn't finding anything on the horizon. I, I think I was out of work for about a month. So even after some after some time, job interviews, phone call interviews, didn't really have any luck. I had an interview with Verizon Wireless. They're like, sell me this product. I'm like, okay, do you want it? No. Okay, bye. And they're like, no, you need to ask why and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, that's that's fine. That's how most salespeople are. But as a, I'm a sales guy now, and I know when someone comes to me, they, they know what they want to buy. And right. I'm not going to sell them something that they don't want. So I'm just not that kind of person for the most part. Um, so finding no job, no luck in, in, um, in any of that. On top of that, I was newly married uh, a few months prior. Um, as a man of the family, you feel your need to just provide. Right. And when you're uh, taking your wife to work, picking her up and coming home, and that's your only job, you feel worthless. Um, so I would take her to work. I'd grab some junk food at the Dollar General on the way home every day, probably for a month. Maybe not every day. Let's not blow it out of 
control, but it was just probably about every day. So what I would get from Dollar General, all right, you got a list? One or two boxes of Swiss rolls. Oh, boy. Okay. I got Pringles, a monster energy drink, other junk food. That was there. Pop, whatever. Gummy bears was one. Um, I didn't write that down, but that was in there. But mostly it was the Swiss rolls. I don't know why. They taste like garbage, but I <laughs> they ate really them. Do. <laughs> I ate them. So I would go home, play video games, apply for a bunch of jobs, and stuff my face with this trash. Can I ask you can I ask you a question? Oh God, yeah, sure. Did you did you like hide the trash from your wife? Oh no, I threw it away real quick. Did you? It was in the garbage. She could just go look. I didn't like hide it. She knew. Um and I think she I think uh, at a she was just like, I think she felt bad. Because it's like, you lose your job, you can't provide, and you're like stuck. Yeah. It's like, um, you know, you, you can't do anything, which is sucks. And so um, so that's all I would do is just play video games, eat junk food, and just wait for, you know, 3.30 to roll around to go get my wife from work and go home, you know. Um, needless to say, this was very, you know, depressing time. It sucks when you... You, you have no per. There's like no purpose besides right. driving to work, picking her up, driving home, and that's it. And I think that you know, I think there's maybe probably some differences between men emotional eating and women or st- stress eating. I sure. should say more than emotional eating, but I think you know, I think for men, a lot of their stress comes from something like you know the the feeling that they need to provide. Um, and if, and and especially if you feel like you're not doing that, that it can cause that type of stress where you would, you know, uh, you would self-medicate with things that are really more destructive. I mean, not only is that, you know, making you unhealthy and perhaps unfit to work, but you know, you're also spending money that you don't have on food that, you, you know, yeah, yeah. I didn't even think about that, but, uh, I don't want to know how much I spend. Well, Let's just say a thousand dollars on Swiss rolls. That's that's enough. <laughs> that's too much for a lifetime to be spending on that crap. In that situation, when it comes to stress eating, there's not really a rational thought process to no. it. You yeah. know, you're just doing it just to do it because it makes you feel good. Basically, no, nobody stress eats broccoli. You know, no, that would be gross. Um, I've definitely also used food to cope. Um, in I really actually think that it's partially a normal thing because food can give people so much pleasure, but I think it becomes problematic when it's like the only thing we turn to and it begins to cause like that additional emotional strain or is, or is destructive. Um, I think a lot of people see that term like coping mechanism as a bad thing, but it's not a bad thing if the coping mechanism is helpful instead of destructive And I think we all need coping mechanisms. We just need to be aware of whether or not they're helping or hurting us. And we need to be aware of like what we're trying to cope with. Sure. Um, And we need to be aware of those emotions. So um, I know you kind of mentioned that like women tend to struggle more with this. You know, I would I would say so, because I mean, um, I don't know. Men just don't show their emotions so depending on what it is i mean i just went to food because it's just like it's there and you just shove this emotional depression of twinkies down my throat (laughs) makes me feel better (laughs) Um, but i think i think just women in general just seem to stress a lot and that's maybe the easiest thing they turn to i don't know what do you think i would agree with that um or you know maybe there's a lot more men who do it but because men tend to be a little bit more closed off when it comes to speaking about emotions and stuff like that or stress like you said they they tend to like go close more inward that maybe they're more like closet stress eaters sure you know and they're just not saying that they're doing it but for sure i would say almost all of the women that i work with um they they report that they struggle with with stress or emotional eating Mm -hmm. and for women, this may not be the same for men. I don't know. I mean, maybe you can say something about this, but I think it goes back to this whole idea of, you know, we, a lot of times we don't feel like we're enough. And if you're, especially like if you're a stay at home mom, you don't feel like you can ever do enough to truly contribute. Like I, that's how I felt when I was a stay at home mom, 
I really felt like I wasn't doing enough to contribute and that just had to do with the money more than anything. So that was a stress for me. Sure. I can see that. Yeah. Um, if you work though, um, as a mom, you feel like you're not, you're not being a good enough mom because you can't be there for every second or for every game and the laundry doesn't get done. Um, and when I, when I meet with women who tell me that they eat emotionally, it's almost always because food is like the only part of their day that they enjoy. So I definitely can relate now seeing um, with Johanna and that uh, not providing financially because I think that's where we're at right now. So, you know, we're trying to get a house and all this other stuff. And I told her, I'm like, if, you, if we can make it to where I can pay for a house and you don't have to work, that's fine. But we're at that point where it's like, you have to work for right now to later that you don't have to. So it's, right. it's kind of balancing. I think we're at a good balance right now to where she's like, yeah, I know I want to, I, I need to work right now, but you know, and maybe the next six months or a year or two years, whatever the time frame is, then she'll be able to not do that because that's not my goal as her husband is to make, get to the point where she doesn't have to work. Right, yeah. right. And then, because I know that's her full-time job is taking care of Levi and then the four or five kids we're going to have. And it's a huge job, right. And I, yeah. you guys want to have more kids. And so, I mean, that's a huge job. And when you factor in the cost of what child care would cost oh, it's while the kids are young, ridiculous. it's crazy. It's ridiculous. So, but you know, a lot of the women that I work with are, they have kids that are nearing the point of being in school full-time, like... Um, so they're, you know, they're like the six, seven, eight range. Sure. And so they're in school all day except for during the summers. And at that point, it's like you sort of feel like, well, what, what do I do now? Or what should I be doing? You know, because, mm -hmm. you know, that, and I don't know, that's, that was just the feeling that I started to get was that, well, you know, I'm here at home. I should be doing something to contribute, even though, you know, there was no pressure from my husband to like, you know, uh, hey, you've got to go back and get a job. Like that transitional period where they're like going from not being in grade school to going into high school or whatever, where they get picked up by the bus and stuff. Is that what right, you're talking about? Right. Okay. I mean, my daughter, she's eight. So she's in, um, she's in third grade right now. I mean, she gets picked up by the bus at about 820. And um, she gets dropped off at about 4.20. Sure. So, so what do you do during that time? Right. Right. And, you know, and I, I started a business and a blog. And so, and again, I love what I do. But a lot of that, a lot of what I'm doing was driven by the fact that I felt compelled to contribute financially. Mm -hmm. And there is a certain amount of stress that goes with that. But... What I find with women is a lot of times food, like they don't allow themselves any pleasure during the day, like every, every day right. during the day, they don't allow themselves any sort of pleasure. So it's like the one thing that they look forward to, it's their time because doing nothing, like for instance, sitting down to read a book or watch a show or whatever is seen as like frivolous or unacceptable or shameful. So eating is doing something, right? When you're eating, you're doing something. I think so. So eating also tends to push like the pleasure buttons in your brain. Right. So it's easy to see how stress, being stressed can cause that eating and it can become a, a habit that's hard to break because it gives us a break. It's like our break. And for me, you know, when again, like going back to when my daughter, uh, when I had stopped breastfeeding and I was like under all of that stress, that mommy stress. Um, for me, it was wine at that time, like at five o'clock when my husband got home, that was my break. <laughs> Nobody was going to take it away from me because it was the only thing I was allowing myself. Yeah. You're reminding me I have to go buy some wine. For Diana. <laughs> yeah, she asked for it. I forgot. Oh, well. But I, I love to ask women this question. When was the last time you felt happy? Did you know that you should feel happy every day? I mean, not not like all day every day, but you should be you should feel happy every day. Um, when was the last time you did something you wanted to do and like only you? Um, did you know that you should be able to do something that you love every day, no matter how frivolous it may seem? Um, that kind of stuff. And so when you start thinking like, when was the last time you really really felt happy? 
you should feel happy every day. Sure. Yeah, I totally agree with that. You should be able to take time for yourself every day. So let's talk about how to deal with some of this stress or emotional eating. Um, I don't know if you want to sort of kick that off. We've sure, got yeah. five things. Yeah, five things here. They're from a PhD, so apparently they know what they're talking about. At least I hope they do. Usually. Usually they do. Okay. So I tried to add some of my real world. Yeah, because you know how they they live in a bubble. I, I guess sometimes <laughs> it all sounds good. Yeah, practical application is the sometimes thing. there is just nothing that can solve your problems better than a box of Oreos. Exactly. <laughs> so we have five things from PhD that states um, there are some things to help with overcoming emotional eating. So one, name that mood. So. Apparently, this is to keep a journal of the mood you are in and the food you're eating. Um, this will give you kind of insight in how your patterns will help you utilize that. Now, if you're like me, sometimes keeping a journal uh, may add to your stress. Right. Uh, just like my fitness pal, when I ask my clients to do that, they don't do it. So I don't do it anymore. Um, but uh, Maybe you don't want. Maybe you don't want to write it down because that's kind of like a physical reminder. Sometimes you can text yourself because I text myself things I need to remind, or uh, say I don't want to write today. I felt depressed and I ate seventeen boxes of Oreos, mm -hmm. so that might be a little deterrent on that end as well. Um, but really, it's just kind of reminding yourself. Okay, during this time I was sad and I ate this. So there's. It's more of kind of having that uh, accountability to where maybe, okay, today I felt sad and I ate chocolate, okay, or whatever. We'll just make it something really bad. Today I ate, I was depressed and I ate a box of Oreos, so tomorrow I feel the same. Maybe I'll choose something different, basically. I So I, I actually have um, my clients do this, and, and again, I struggle with the same thing. A lot of my clients, they are really resistant to doing this, especially if they've dieted a lot because it's sort of very similar to like tracking calories and tracking food. So I call it a food and feelings journal, and, and people typically hate it, but if I can get them to do it, it really does work. Um, and the most important thing with naming that mood or doing like a food and feelings journal is, is making sure that you're not judging what you're writing down. So when you connect the fact that you ate 17 boxes of Oreos with the fact that you were sad, um, you know, there shouldn't be a judgment call there because eating the Oreos was serving some, to some type of a purpose for you. So it's just identifying that purpose and hopefully the next time you can identify that feeling or that emotion you can say you know what i felt really crappy after eating those 17 boxes of oreos i want to see if i can handle this a little bit better this time sure you know yeah. <laughs> off completely off topic i just thought about eating 17 boxes of oreos it does really sound good it right does now. sound good you we can ha I, I haven't eaten dinner so <laughs> Yeah. We're always doing this like right before it's time to eat. Yeah, I haven't ate dinner either. So. <laughs> All right, so number two, ride the storm out. So um, knowing that bad feelings can ebb and flow just like the tide of the tide of the oceans, you know, can last a minute to hours. Um, you know, this usually seems to say there is a bad feeling. How long can I go feeling this way without going to food? Um, and within the first five seconds, in the first 10 minutes, you know, it's basically seeing how long you can go to where you can withstand that feeling of need to eat or going to whatever that is. And then seeing the next time, if you can last a little bit longer. I wanted to add to this one I, because I do think that it is a really good idea for people to try and like feel their emotions or, you know, understand where their stress is coming from because You'll never quit stress eating. You'll never quit emotional eating if you don't identify the underlying cause of your stress eating. But I would add to this one that it's really a good idea, I think, to ref to find at least initially a replacement activity because like sometimes riding it out can just make you brood about wanting to eat. Like right now I'm thinking about Oreos. Sure, yeah. 
And so again, that's sort of stuck in my head, but it's a bit like trying to give up smoking or soda. You need to replace the vice with something else until your body gets over like the hand to mouth motion. Sure. Yeah. And so for some people this, like it's going to be chewing gum or it's going to be doing something more constructive, drinking a cup of herbal tea, taking a walk outside, doing a puzzle, doing Qigong on YouTube or something like that. Something that's going to sort of replace the activity or at least sort of take your mind off of it and, you know, see if you can sort of delay eating for 10 minutes. Um, And then if you can delay for 10 minutes and sort of busy or occupy your mind in the Oreos pop back in your mind, can you delay again for another five minutes? Sure. Yeah. It makes total sense. Yeah. All right. Number three, don't empower your vices. So basically this means just don't give power to foods are you already have an issue with so if i'm buying a swiss rolls i'm not going to put them in my house you know it just empowers those things to make it harder to resist and studies even show that eating a high fat high sugar foods can affect the activity part of your brain that manages stress which actually further enforce your resilience on eating in response to stress so if you feel you can't resist eating, reach for a healthier option like fruit. I would say fruit, not vegetables, because who the heck wants to eat vegetables? When <laughs> right, fruit, definitely. Definitely have the healthy options available. And I think that's a really important point that you made, though, that if at least for a time, you need to keep those quote-unquote vice foods out of your house. And I deal a lot with emotional and binge eaters, and there's a fine line there between you know, you, at some point you have to allow yourself to have those foods. But I, when I work with people, I try and tell them that there are no foods that are off the table. You can't, you know, there are no, no, no foods, but if you have specific foods that tend that you tend to be drawn to, or that trigger you to overeat or the, you know, that you like to stress eat, right? if you're willing to drive all the way to the store to get them, then maybe, you know, maybe you need that food. But a lot of times, because people don't, you know, people are pretty lazy. If it's not in your house and there's healthier options available, then, you know, it's more likely that you're going to make a better choice. So Mm -hmm. keeping those vice foods out of the house, I think is really important. All right. Number four, healthy coping. So... Exercise is always a good way to yes. go as far as release good hormones in your brain. Any sort of movement yeah. is is shown. I mean, studies show time and again that any sort of movement uh, releases those endorphins. And yeah. Yeah, just working out, yep. uh, talking to somebody, talking with your emotional animal at work, with your support person. Um, it's definitely going to help you with those emotions and kind of see maybe, oh, okay, it's not as bad as you may think it is. Right. People should identify, you know, if, if you're if you're a stress case and you find yourself eating because of stress, you need to identify a person who you can call and talk to. Right. Someone That's stable. Really yeah. Right. They're not going to feed into the same thing. Even if it's somebody you have to pay, like a therapist. I charge $50 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Conquering the hard time is key to a long story term success so it's pretty self-explanatory if you think that losing weight and staying on that path during the easy times is going to be all that time fairyland it's going to be super easy i'm just going to eat whatever i want and lose weight and blah 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 blah. it's not going to happen so life is chaos if you uh, can persevere during the time that is hard you know you're going to become stronger be able to deal with more the craziness in the long run so I would say just challenge yourself to keep more of a healthy lifestyle, even during those stressful times. I run into this a lot with clients, and it's a really tough thing. Um, I want to be understanding, and I and I hate being pushy, but too often people want to give up when their life gets tough or life throws some sort of a you know a monkey wrench at them. And I've had a couple of clients who have severe health issues that sometimes prevent them from being consistent with something like working out sure. or, you know, eat, even eating healthy. And they always feel like they're starting at square one because they have to keep starting and stopping. But I do my best to encourage them to keep coming or, you know, keep doing what they're doing whenever they can, as often as they can, because life is never going to be perfect. There's never 
a right time to do anything, to get married, to have a kid, to start a business, to get a puppy, to begin an exercise program, to change your health, change your life. The people who are most successful are the ones who don't let adversity thwart their forward momentum. So like, and that's no matter how slow the going is may be. Um, I really believe that sometimes the best time to start like an exercise or a healthy eating program is when it appears to be the worst time in your life because it can give you that little bit of spark uh, to say, I can do this. Like, I can do this despite all the things that are happening in my life. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, and you get to that point where you just either get fed up or you just, you know, tell yourself you can do this. And, you know, once you see the first result, whether it's a pound or two pounds, that's a huge accomplishment. Right. And you definitely shouldn't be like, oh, well, this person lost this much weight in this month of time. Who cares? Th- right. That they're not you. I mean, one pound or two pounds or ten pounds is huge. Right. I mean, you have to put a lot of work just to just to burn one. So that's always um, something to keep in mind. So um, these are part of stress questions. You know, kind of go hand in hand. So how do we cope with stress? Some people, it's emotional eating, smoking, drinking, wine, or countless other things. Um, eating's my fault. And sweets is probably my fall guy. Kelly's is obviously that wine bottle. And sweets. And sweets. Oh, oh. And sweets. <laughs> so when I do get stressed, I usually currently go for Monster Energy drinks because there's no carbs, no calories. Um, obviously, we know now if you listen to the intermittent fasting one, I can't drink it while I'm fasting. So that's mean. Um, but ma- mainly, uh, I have that, and it's sweet enough to where it kind of like gets me out of that area it's not that i'm super stressed i'm gonna eat junk food it's just that it's sweet enough to where it craves that and then i'm fine um uh is there anything you kind of go to if you have that for food yeah well i'm like caffeine i think you know coffee like every now and then i get a real craving for coffee at like two or three in the afternoon sure that's usually for me as a lack of sleep or, um, you know, something else going on that's causing some sort of stress or, um, but when it comes to, when it comes to food, um, definitely donuts, I think probably (laughs) uh, donuts and cake. Well, donuts are are not zero calorie, Kelly. They they are. Oh, (laughs) you mean, what do I go to that? Yeah. That would help me. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's tough. You know, the first thing that pops into my head would be going outside and taking a walk. Okay. Um, anything that I can do that moves my body. So whether that be um, like a 10-minute Qigong that I find on YouTube or going outside and walking the dog, um, those have been huge for me because for some reason that just gives me, it, it just gives me enough of a feel good like, hey, I chose to go out and take a walk to deal with my problems instead of eating them, eating right. donuts. <laughs> to get out of that funk. Yeah, just to get out of right. that funk for that, that right. moment. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I, I do cheat, cheat day every week. Um, that's kind of when I stress eat, I guess, but not really. I just kind of, I went cookies and junk food. So, um, anyway, so the main point is really, we all have a scapegoat. We go to is kind of just identifying what that is and then trying to, um, ride the storm out, day of a journal, um, all the things that we kind of cover just to kind of, you know, get you through that part. Um, so here are some ways to kind of cope with stress and Kelly's going to lead this off. Yeah, um, I I added one in here to to our notes, and that would be awareness. Um, you need to be aware of the behavior, and you need to be asking yourself questions. Like if you find yourself stress eating or eating for emotional reasons, you need to a- start asking yourself the questions of you know what's missing in my life. What is it that I really need right now? What void is food or alcohol or whatever you're using? What void is it filling in your life? Because I like to tell people that emotional eating or stress eating is a, is basically a cry for help. It doesn't solve the underlying issue. So you need to bring awareness to the fact that you are doing something that's destructive to your health. And, but, but you have to do so and not like a, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this again. I suck. I have no, you know, I have no willpower because it's not about that. It's just the fact that you're not really addressing like what's really going on here. That's causing me to have the symptom of wanting to eat. Right. 
it makes total sense. So number two, to cope with stress, take care of yourself. I mean, most people don't do this. I know my wife sometimes doesn't do it. And you have to like, hey, hey, guess what? You have a hundred bucks or whatever. You can get your hair done and do all that stuff. <laughs> so she's all excited. So whenever she does that, she'll be all excited. You know, take care of yourself. You know, eating healthy, well-balanced meals, you know, all that. Fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, all that kind of stuff. Um, you want to exercise on a daily basis or on a regular basis, whether it's, you know, three days a week is probably good to start, you know, 10, 20 minutes. Um, definitely get a plenty of sleep. Now, if you're new, new moms or moms with, you know, babies that don't want to sleep, you know, that's going to be tough. But if you can do it and, you know, your baby's sleeping through the night, um, that's one thing to definitely um, consider. What I uh, what I tell moms sometimes is that just to understand that it's a phase in your life that's going to be difficult, and that it will it will pass. Right. Yeah. You know? Well, we're gonna have like ten kids, so Ooh. yeah, we're. It went we're, from like four to ten. Oh my well, gosh! I just want to increase the amount of <laughs> stress. I guess I don't know. No, it's only gonna be like four or five. <laughs> Um, so you want to give yourself a break, you know, take your time, take time for yourself. Cause I mean, um, I, like I say, I get up at four 30 in the morning. That's my time. Um, you know, if you really just need to find 10, 20, an hour, if you can just your time to kind of just have that time to you. I think, I think I want to add to this because I, a lot of women feel like, I think they feel, especially moms with kids, they feel like they can't ask for help. You need to ask for help sometimes. And whether that be from, you know, somebody that you trust, you can watch your kids or your husband, or, you know, you need somebody to rely on. If you have young kids, you deserve to have time every day, Sure. but yeah. you may need to ask somebody to help you out. So when your husband comes home and say, you know, Hey, I need 20 minutes to go read a magazine or something. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. So Johanna, you can ask all you want. I don't Johanna, care. you kick his ass and you tell him you just need some time to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> she does do that sometimes. She'll go be like, Good. I want to go to the store just so I can listen to my music. Yep. Yeah. So talk to others, you know, a good person to talk to or um, the sounding board is definitely always helping coping with stress. Definitely calm you down, give you different perspectives, especially when you're like stressing out about something. It might not even be that big of a deal. You're just making a bigger issue than it needs to be. Um, we're going to avoid things like drugs and alcohol. I don't drink wine, so I don't smoke. I don't do any of that stuff. Ugh. You can avoid it. I mean, within reason, a bottle of wine a night is probably not within reason. Well, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, you, you have to be really aware. So I still have a glass of wine or a beer almost every night. And for me, it's my time to take 20 minutes and sit down. And so I realize it's actually not the wine that I need. It's the 20 minutes of time to decompress from the day. But I still do have that drink almost nightly because I, more than anything, I actually enjoy the taste of wine. And so I do allow myself that pleasure, but I think awareness has helped me realize that it could become a problem if I'm not careful. Um, like after, you know, the, after I had my daughter, so I drink no more than one glass. Um, and I often go back to measuring wine, like how much, because my glass, my wine glasses can hold like three quarters of a bottle. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was making sure I didn't read that wrong. Like, oh oh yeah. No, no, no. I got like the big wine glasses, you know? And so unfortunately my, my little four or five ounce pour, it looks like there's nothing in the glass. I need to get smaller wine glasses. There you go. Trick but yourself, yeah. The key for me is twofold. I feel if I feel if I need to drink more than one glass, that to me becomes a warning sign that I'm not taking care of myself in some way. So that's the awareness. And since alcohol and food, I should say, these things are not inherently bad when consumed in moderation. Um, so I force myself to sit down and sip the wine slowly. So again, it's, it's a break for me. It's something that I allow myself to do. I allow myself that break to enjoy it um, because it's the break that I actually need, not the wine. But I do enjoy that little bit of wine during my break. But, you know, and it also forces me to sit down and really say, hey, you know what? I'm going to sip on this wine because it's only like five ounces, which is like nothing. Right. <laughs> 
So the reason that wine or food or smoking or sex or whatever it is becomes a coping mechanism is because it's a way that we give to ourselves. It's a form of self-care, even when it's destructive to the self or when it becomes destructive. So it's really not about the food. It's not about the wine. It's about the underlying reasons for why you're overdoing it. Sure. Yeah, it makes total sense. Take a break. Last one we're going to cover It's easy to do. Um, It's something that's causing stress, taking time away from work. I know in personal day, we have two, um, you have personal day at work, you have personal time. I think we have two 15 minute breaks. So if if you need to take a 15 minute break just to walk outside, barring that it's not, you know, snowing or raining because we're in Ohio, but, um, you know, that definitely is going to help with that. Do you know how many people I come across that when I ask them if they take a lunch break at work and they're like, no, I work at my desk while I'm eating. I do. And I'm like, no, I'm like, no. I'm like, you take your lunch break. You earn that lunch break. Take I like a break. I like to leave early, so <laughs> I work through lunch. <laughs> but didn't you say you worked with a, or you coached a client and you had her get up like maybe 10 or 15 minutes earlier and that really sort of changed a lot? About yeah, her. yeah. She came in, she felt, she looked, I mean, she looked different because I think she got her hair cut, um, but she just felt better. She felt more like she accomplished something and it just set her set her day off, especially with all the stress and stuff she's been dealing with. Um, but you definitely see a noticeable difference. Um, even in myself, I feel like, um, you know, starting my day off with that, you know, two hours before um, Levi or Joanne even gets up is just time that I need to get stuff done and time I can spend for myself, like need to do that that's been big for me too um i i get up probably an hour and a half before everybody else in my house and um that that is my me time and um and and if mark gets up early i get really bent out of shape (laughs) (laughs) i do when levi gets up because i'll get my time yeah i'll get up at 5 30 and one time you got up at like five or i get before 30 get up at like five like what are you doing up (laughs) Go to sleep. Oh, yeah. I remember those days, too, when Aaliyah was young, and I would try and get up early to, to beat her getting up. And if she would wake up early, I would be like, no, <laughs> you need to go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, everyone, we covered stress, eating while stressed. I hope that you took some time to kind of, like, sift through these ideas and, you know, take and use them. Um, but is there anything you really want to cover at the end? I don't think so. I think we pretty much nailed that one. All right. Well, until next time, guys. Hey, everyone. This is TJ and Kelly with the Initiative Project Podcast. If you like what you heard, please like, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any questions you'd like us to cover, please email us at initiative.podcast.